lunch and coming back. Um, so I'm uh, Matt Blaze. They asked me to uh, give a talk, and they didn't ask me uh, to talk about anything in particular. So I'm going to talk um, for a little while about not much in particular, but uh, kind of broadly what we've learned uh, as hackers and what we're good at and what we're bad at. And so um, what I decided to call this is cryptography and failure um, because we're good at both of those things. Um, and in particular, we're, we, we've actually gotten pretty good at, um, you know, doing cryptography. And that's actually something that's changed during, you know, my professional lifetime. We've gone from a world in which we really didn't know what we were doing to a world in which the civilian non-NSA crypto community, um, you know, is surprisingly um, sophisticated and, and good at what it does. And yet, um, security is probably worse now than it ever was. So somehow we've managed to get good at security and good at failing um, at the same time. So I, I'd like to just spend a minute talking about you know where we fail and giving an example of where we fail. So we, you know we we fail in a number of different ways, and the probably the most prominent way we look for failure is um, in algorithms and 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 protocols, right? I mean we 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 do things like say oh well there's cryptography involved uh, and there are cryptographic protocols involved and those are written down really formally. And you know, let's let's really look at them carefully and see if there's something wrong with them. And you know, interestingly, you know, an example of our success is that we sometimes fail there. Um, you know, we sometimes find things that are that are wrong there. But it's um, um, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, it, it's pretty rare to see a cryptographic zero day in a fielded system. Um, you know, now when it happens, it's very exciting because it tends to apply to many, many different things. But it's, it's still um, more the exception than the rule. Um, <coughs> and so, of course, uh, as particularly as an academic, but even as a, as, as a non-academic researcher, or at least as the sort of person who likes to publish papers, um, in spite of the fact that that's probably the least fruitful place to look for problems, that's where we spend most of our time. Right. I mean, that's where we that's where we reward people for writing papers, and that's where we we encourage people to uh, to, to spend all of their time um, looking for new cryptographic uh, um, and, and protocol weaknesses. And it's you know it's a lot like that old um, uh, that old joke about the guy who's standing uh, on a street corner um, uh, looking down, and you know somebody finally comes up to him and says, "What are you looking for? Can I help you?" Yeah, I'm looking for my keys. I lost them. And uh, oh, uh, well, you know, where 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 do you lose them? About two blocks down. And uh, well, why are you looking here? Well, there's that street light. The light is much better here. And you know, we know how to look for problems in crypto protocols, so that's what we do. And uh, it 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 almost never works. But then there's failures of engineering and implementation. And you know, there we often see failures. Um, and we, um, uh, you know, that that is, we we have bugs in software. We have uh, design uh, flaws in systems, um, and you know, we have architectural um, failures of design. And that actually occurs, you know, probably a factor of ten times more often, at least than uh, cryptographic failures, but we don't really know how to formalize it quite as well, right? I mean, we, you know, we have some notion of correct programming, but it boils down to comparing one program, or maybe the specification of a program, to another program, and actually that's one of the very few things in computer science we can prove we don't know how to do. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's hard. Um, and it's hard to know whether you've got the specification right in the first place, and so we we fail a lot there. But when we fail there, we often get to say, "Oh well, whatever went wrong, it was somebody else's fault," and so the system was fine, um, even though it it, uh, it didn't work. And then finally, we we have failures of systems as a whole, and I'm not even sure how to how to characterize that. And um, uh, failures of the security provided by a mechanism to match the security 
that is required uh, by the application. And in fact, almost all of our failures fall into that category. And that category is both the most fruitful um, to look for vulnerabilities in and the uh, most difficult to even uh, nail down. Um, and so, um, you know, with that lesson, um, you know, sort of well learned, and I think people, anybody who looks for vulnerabilities in systems knows this intuitively and extremely well, um, we still spend our time looking under the street light where the light is, you know, at the crypto algorithms and protocols. So I want to give you uh, an example of where I've been guilty of this um, in, in my group, and it may be some work that, that you're familiar with, um, but I'm, I'm going to go over it very briefly. And uh, then I'll talk about what we can learn from that for some current public policy debates where computer security and cryptography and, you know, the government are uh, um, smashing into each other head on. Um, <coughs> so the example that I want to give of a failure, and I'm talking about both a failure in terms of the system and also a failure in terms of the way that we went about analyzing it, um, was a system uh, that I looked at a couple of years ago with my grad students called um, APCO Project 25. So APCO Project 25 is this um, two-way radio uh, standard that was developed in the early 1990s as a successor to something called APCO Project 16. I'm not quite sure I understand their naming scheme um, all that well. Um, it was intended to basically be a digital drop-in replacement uh, protocol for analog um, FM narrowband two-way radio uh, used by public safety and uh, similar uh, types of land mobile radio users. So this is a, uh, a two-way uh, radio system. Um, it was designed in the early 1990s. It really started to take off in the early uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. Equipment started to become uh, available for it. Uh, <coughs> and, and the federal government went kind of wild buying equipment for it. Uh, at about the same time that the equipment started to become available and the government started buying it, uh, they started to graft onto it security standards. Um, because this is digital two-way radio, um, it's, um, it's now <coughs> much easier to add encryption and other kinds of security features to it. Um, in particular, uh, you know, digitizing uh, you know, once something's digitized, it's just plain old cryptography on digital data. Uh, securing analog voice is much harder um, and generally doesn't, doesn't work all that well, degrades quality. Um, encryption doesn't degrade quality at all, and it's very straightforward to do because of the layered model that you get with digital uh, communication. Um, so um, the, uh, <coughs> um, the, this was a heavily constrained problem. Um, so, the, in particular, the P25 system is intended to be spectrum compatible with its predecessor. And what that means is that it has to use exactly the same frequency allocation model as analog systems, even though if you've got a digital system, there are all sorts of things you could do that might be more spectrum efficient and more resistant to, to um, various uh, kinds of interference and uh, might, uh, might work better, things like spread spectrum. Um, you couldn't do that with this system because it was intended to replace the individual narrow band channels uh, that carried voice over the analog systems that it was intended to replace um, and uh, had to, in fact, be able to coexist with those systems. They couldn't just, you know, this would be like changing, uh, okay, everybody all at once stop using IP. Uh, we can't really do that. We have to come up with something that, uh, that, that's incrementally, incrementally compatible. Okay, so how does this work? Well, the channels have to fit into a narrow band uh, channel. That's a 12 and a half kilohertz wide allocation of spectrum that has to carry voice. Um, and so uh, that's the same bandwidth of a standard uh, analog voice channel uh, for land mobile radio. Now, that basically means you can fit comfortably about 9,600 bits per second into that, uh, into that channel over the constraints of radio. And they do that with an encoding, you know, a, 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 a baud encoding 
of uh, 4,800 uh, two-bit uh, symbols uh, per second that they send. And the voice is encoded using a standard vocoder called IMBE um, that uh, gives actually surprisingly reasonable speech quality at that uh, bit rate. It's you know pretty good sort of telephone quality or maybe a little little bit worse than telephone quality audio. Um, sounds a little bit different than analog FM, but it's still pretty pretty good. Um, and it uh, you know it's actually fairly computationally intensive and generally needs uh, specialized hardware to, to implement just the vocoder itself and the, the decoding. Um, the vocoder <coughs> divides speech up into 180 millisecond uh, long frames. And if you do the division, um, that's uh, 1728 bits um, per 180 millisecond uh, frame um, that are sent out one after the other. So a stream of a voice uh, stream basically consists of these 180 millisecond 1,728-bit uh, chunks of uh, data sent uh, in a train one after the other. And, you know, there's, there are a couple of details here. There are two different kinds of these frames but they uh, that carry different metadata in each. But each of those frames basically contains the bulk of those 1,728 bits are IMBE-encoded voice, and then they're, and that might or might not be encrypted. Um, and then the rest of it, um, a few other bits, um, are metadata basically saying, hey, this is the type of frame it is. It's a voice frame. It's encrypted or it's not encrypted. Here's the unit ID that's being sent um, and, um, and, and so on so that the receiver can receive it. Now, um, the one thing that's important to remember is that this is digital communication, but it's a digital communication that that is very different from the vast majority of protocols that we design for things like the internet. Um, <clears throat> in particular, although this is intended for something that is ostensibly called two-way radio, it's in fact a almost completely one-way protocol. Um, the um, transmitter is broadcasting and receivers are entirely passive. So there are no acknowledgments um, uh, that are sent back or, or any, any notion of a session in the same way that uh, you know we tend to design protocols and we tend to analyze protocols, this is put the transmitter puts stuff out over the air, and it is entirely up to the receiver to be able to um, uh, receive it. Um, now uh, another property is this is going over radio. Now with wireline um, digital protocols. Um, we tend to uh, have an error property where it's pretty much either all or nothing. Um, you know, you've either corrupted your uh, your packet or your frame or what have you, um, or it has gotten through completely perfectly. And what we tend to do is design protocols where the model is either accept completely or reject completely. Um, and uh, in fact, it, over a radio protocol, that would work horribly. Because the nature of radio is there are little transient fades and multipath transmission and things that will cause, you know, a few of the bits to get corrupted with very high probability on almost every transmission. Um, so this has to tolerate, um, uh, um, uh, you know, low grade errors without um, being, uh, without just stopping completely because low grade errors are just really normal. Right, right. A, a, a non-zero bit error rate is normal. So it makes heavy use of forward error correction, um, which is to say the vocoder itself uh, can tolerate some drop bits. The more drop bits there are, the lower the quality of the audio. But if you, you know, if you um, kill 10% of the bits, it'll still sound pretty recognizable. Um, and uh, so that's an that's uh, important property. And the metadata uh, that's used when you decode these frames uh, also um, is forward error corrected um, so that if a few of those bits are uh, are corrupted, you can recover what the actual payload bits uh, are of the metadata. Um, and in fact, there are about 64 bits of important metadata in each of them in a couple of different frames that are each error corrected. Okay, so we analyzed this protocol, my graduate students and I, because we were bored, basically. Um, we, you know, we got some, some grant money uh, to look at, um, um, at um, GSM and um, other mobile cellular phones, and you know, we discovered that the equipment 
um, wasn't quite available that we needed. And so what are we going to do? Well, we decided, well, let's look at some other protocol and hope that they don't notice that we didn't look at the one that they paid us to look for. Um, and, you know, this is radio. It's sort of the same. Nobody will, nobody will care. Um, and uh, so um, I hope no one's from NSF here. Um, the uh, So... What did we do? Well, we looked at the protocols, and we did that by, by getting copies of the standards, which we had to, to get by interlibrary loan from Canada, because they charged so much for the standards, we couldn't actually afford to buy them. It would have killed our entire budget, but we found a library in Canada that was willing to, to, to lend them to us. And we, we looked at the standards, and we, and we, you know, our first reaction was, oh my God, the security standards for this look as if somebody from the NSA showed up at the first meeting and then stopped showing up. Um, because it had all of this sort of good terminology, um, you know, things like they talked about key material and uh, crypto variables and all this sort of fairly NSA spooky looking terminology. And then almost every actual cryptographic decision that they made was unbelievably bad. Um, and, um, you know, like not unbelievably bad, like some subtle secret backdoor bad, but unbelievably bad, like the security guy isn't here, what do we do? Oh, well, let's just keep going. Um, and it turned out that's actually what happened. Um, so, um, so we found actually numerous weaknesses in the protocols. Um, so first of all, everything is unauthenticated, even if you've got key material, um, which uh, among other things means that um, parts of the protocol are vulnerable to uh, replay attacks. Um, and there's, in particular, a sub-protocol of it called over-the-air rekeying um, that um, uh, becomes extremely vulnerable because of this. And there's a you know, very slightly um, uh, clever replay that you can do that'll wipe people's keys out remotely. And it's just like you look at the standard and it becomes immediately obvious. Um, what it is. Um, metadata is not encrypted, and that includes unit identif unique unit identifiers and when the option is turned on, their location. And this appears to have just been a, uh, an error uh, in the specification because they're attempting to do this. It says that this is one of the requirements, um, uh, but then they just don't actually encrypt any of the metadata. And what that means is that if you uh, if people have location services turned on, an adversary can basically create a map of where everyone is um, in a system, even if they can't decrypt the uh, voice. So if you've seen the Harry Potter movies, which, by the way, I haven't, but my students tell me, this is just like the Marauder's map that you can create um, uh, from uh, Harry Potter, where you see where your adversary is um, at all time. Um, so when the surveillance people are um, following you around, uh, you can you can see where they are. Um, and uh, we discovered um, uh, a remarkably um, uh, terrible uh, uh, susceptibility to denial of service because of the way the framing is arranged. Um, so in particular, I'm going to talk very briefly about that because that was probably the most, um, that was where most of the light that we applied was uh, to this uh, to this protocol. And <coughs> basically, there's aggressive forward error correcting, but they don't forward or error correct that entire 1,728-bit frame. Instead, they forward error correct individual fields. So each individual field of that frame is separately error corrected. And, uh, you know, why is that good or why is that bad? Well, it's good in the sense that you can apply different types of error correction to different parts of the frame, and that might be a little more bit efficient. But it means also that an adversary can select an individual subfield to jam if they've got good timing synchronization. Um, <clears throat> they can just pick out an individual field and block it out and not bother blotting out uh, other fields if they only care about... Um, um, jamming one of them. Well, one of those fields um, is a 64-bit field that actually contains 16 bits of payload um, that identifies the type of frame. And in particular, it identifies, you know, is this encrypted? Is this in the clear? Is this a voice frame? And that, that 64 bits out of those 728 bits is essential for the receiver to be able to demodulate the rest of the frame. If they don't have those 64 bits, um, they can't do anything with uh, the rest of, of, the, uh, of the 1,728 bits. 
And so what that means is that if a jammer has good timing synchronization and turns on their jamming transmitter for 64 bits out of uh, the 728 bits, uh, 1728 bits, which they can helpfully do because it comes right after a synchronization field in the, in the frame. So it's very easy to, to build a piece of equipment that, that does this timing, or at least in principle it should be. Um, they can, uh, essentially achieve something that is, uh, you know, kind of unprecedented in the history of jamming. Uh, the way you, you identify the jamming resistance of a, of a, of a radio system is by comparing the energy required by the jammer to the energy required by the user. And in a, if you do nothing and you just design a kind of dumb protocol, it's roughly 50-50. If the jam, whoever has the most energy wins. Uh, if you're designing a system to resist jamming, you want to make the jammer use a large amount more energy than the system that you're trying to, uh, that they're trying to jam. So maybe 10 or 20 dB more at a minimum. And things like spread spectrum um, achieve that in, in different ways, particularly if they keep the spreading sequence uh, in an encrypted uh, way. So you can actually achieve um, <coughs> really good resistance uh, by an, from an energy comparison um, uh, to uh, jamming. And again, if you do nothing, it's just um, uh, the strongest uh, wins, uh, might makes right. Um, but this protocol manages to, to go exactly backwards because of this ability to jam individual subfields. The jammer actually enjoys a 14 decibel by power um, advantage uh, because they only have to turn on their, their jamming transmitter in short bursts. And what that means is that, you know, with a couple of AA batteries uh, worth of, uh, of energy, you can build a fairly powerful jammer that'll last for days and days um, against a fairly high-powered uh, system um, in principle. Okay, so why is that bad? Well, jamming systems is bad, particularly jamming systems that are used for public safety and surveillance and by the Secret Service and the FBI and, and all of those things. But in particular, you can interact with the security part of the protocol in really mean ways if you do this. So the scenario that we thought of was very selective jamming. On, teach the users that the encryption doesn't work and do that by only jamming encrypted transmissions so that um, they learn to turn off their encryption in order for the messages to get through. Um, and um, so, um, you know, that, that might be a, an interesting scenario in which the encryption works, um, but uh, it doesn't actually uh, work for the users, and so they're forced to, to turn it off. And again, fortunately, the part that says this is an encrypted transmission comes right before the part that you have to actually jam. So again, you could build a, uh, you could build a, uh, a, a jammer that synchronizes and, and recognizes this very easily. Okay, so how hard is this to do in practice? So um, one of my grad students at the time, a fellow by the name of Travis Goodspeed, um, who I'm sure you all know, he is probably the most dangerous person I've ever had in my lab in all respects, because he kept ordering all these dangerous chemicals, like they stopped accepting his packages in the mail room because of all the scary <laughs> stickers uh, that were on them. Uh, and, you know, he kept saying, hey, where, you know, can I use a, a fume hood? And I said, well, I don't have a fume hood. And he says, okay, never mind. And then, you know, he's doing this stuff in the lab with smoke and then things start corroding. Um, it was, so, um, so Travis said, oh, you know, I know how to build one of these. Okay, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, God, what's it going to cost? You know, we're going to actually build this high synchronization radio equipment. He said, oh, no, there's this thing um, here. It was called an IME, um, which was a, a toy marketed at preteen girls in the early 2000s that has a chipset in it that turns out to be exactly compatible with the way the P25 uh, um, uh, uh, transmissions are framed. And of course, he ha it has a little JTAG interface inside it. If you solder some pins to it, you can reprogram this uh, chip to build the little recognizer um, to synchronize um, frames and turn on. And it conveniently takes not two, but three uh, AA batteries. Um, and um, can, if you soup it up, put out about 800 milliwatts of uh, power, um, but if you do it in really short bursts, you can get it to like even more than that. Um, and, uh, and they turn out to be really cheap because the service they use 
went out of business. So they're kind of useless for their original purpose, and you could just buy these things for about $8 each on eBay. Uh, the chip itself um, would have cost about $25 each, so it was cheaper to buy it in this little pink box um, than it was to do it. So we bought a whole bunch of them um, and um, programmed them to do that, and you know that developed this sort of nice group of uh, concept. We built the, the My First Jammer. Um, so, um, so we were very proud of ourselves and we did what, what we do as academics, which was not deploy these around the city and go on a bank robbery spree, um, but, um, you know, we wrote a paper. And, but before we wrote the paper, we wanted to know, hey, you know, we're smart, but we're not the only smart people around. Um, you know, our bad, have bad guys figured this out too. Are, you know, people actually deploying this. And so we decided to build a network of receivers um, to monitor over the air sensitive P25 transmissions like of the FBI and the State Department and the Secret Service and all of these agencies to see if we could recognize the attack packets that we were um, sending out to see if, you know, has somebody else figured this out? Are they doing this to these people? And <coughs> it turned out that, in fact, it, um, I, to make a long story short, um, it was easy to identify the frequencies that they're using uh, for sensitive stuff because they're the ones with encrypted traffic on it. Um, and it turns out there's also redundant metadata that they use, like you can tell which agency is using it from the unit IDs that they're doing, and it took us a little exercise in traffic analysis to figure out um, how to reliably identify who um, was transmitting uh, on what uh, channel, but we figured out, okay, this is the Secret Service, this is the State Department, this is this is just the post office, and um, uh, and and uh, so on. Um, and then we we said, okay, well, let's let's record this stuff. And then you know, as we're configuring it, we notice that we're getting on these encrypted channels a whole bunch of clear traffic. And we're doing some investigation, and think, aha, somebody had scooped us, and is is doing exactly the stuff that we had discovered. Wow, that's really something. There was a zero day out there in this protocol. But no, we couldn't actually find any evidence of any malicious activity. We would just see all this clear traffic on these otherwise encrypted channels. And it turns out that none of the attacks uh, turned out to actually be necessary. There was no need to bother with any uh, looking where the light was and uh, analyzing this protocol. So uh, in 1995, I attended a conference that I go to called Crypto. It's the conference for cryptographers. It's held in Santa Barbara every August. It's very nice. It's right on the beach. Um, they, um, it, it, so the cryptographers basically have this week-long party. They had invited as their keynote speaker in 1995 um, one of the um, head uh, cryptographers at the National Security Agency, a fellow by the name of Bob Morris. He's the father of another Robert Morris that you may have heard of. Um, and he worked at NSA, and he promised at the beginning of his talk that he was going to reveal the NSA's rule of first rule of cryptanalysis. And so I made sure, okay, it's worth getting up early and going to this talk. Uh, I want to learn the NSA's rule, the first rule of cryptanalysis. That might be useful. I'm kind of surprised he's revealing it. Um, you know, I'll bet it's I'll bet it's really good. You know, he's going to say something like, you know, use Gaussian elimination on the S boxes or something like that. Uh, and then you know, then you get the clear text. So he said, okay, rule one of, of cryptanalysis, and it's very important because it will it works about 50 percent of the time. Rule one of cryptanalysis: look for clear text. <laughs> and that was it. Um, so um, we did we did that um, with this uh, P25 system. Um, so we um, basically found all of the channels that they were using, configured a network of receivers um, in a number of metropolitan areas, Philly obviously being one, but you know other large metropolitan areas that you can imagine that we so basically everywhere we had friends. Uh, we said, "Hey, can you put this box in your apartment? No, don't ask any questions. Um, put the antenna near the window." And um, uh, you know, had it upload every night uh, everything that it got on the sensitive uh, government uh, channels. And uh, we also checked with our lawyers to make sure it was legal. Uh, it turns out it is, amazingly. Um, so what we discovered was that, in fact, on the channels that have sensitive traffic that are encrypted, mostly they're encrypted. But on average, there's about 30 minutes a day of just out of the blue clear transmission that just starts at some point, and then 
you know, it goes back to being encrypted after a while. Or some fraction of users just don't have encryption uh, turned on. And uh, we're trying to figure out what on earth is going on here. And some of the sensitive stuff, I mean like really sensitive, um, you know, things, things like, all right, I have the informant in the car, except they say CI because it sounds cooler. I have the informant in the car with me. He's the guy in the green shirt. Uh, you know, information that might be kind of useful if you're the target of that investigation. Um, and, you know, the um, sensitive traffic used, you know, when they're doing executive protection of the, you know, people like the president and, and, and so on just, you know, goes out in the, uh, uh, the clear. Interestingly, the agency, um, we, we discovered sensitive traffic from every agency we had heard of, plus a few agencies that we hadn't heard of, um, that, uh, that we tracked down. But one agency never, ever transmitted any clear traffic. They were always 100% encrypted. And, you know, you're thinking, well, who would that agency be? Obviously the NSA. No, actually the NSA security forces, they're, they're in the clear all the time around Fort Meade. Um, uh, the postal inspector. Yeah. Don't mess with the postal inspector. They they understand crypto. Um, um, and, uh, so uh, I ended up actually talking to the postal inspector's uh, information tech guy, and he said, yeah, basically there was this guy, he retired, he just drilled this into everybody to get the crypto right. But almost everybody else um, it sends traffic in the clear, and it was just completely inexplicable. So why? Well, so what we discovered was that <coughs> a frequent problem, and we did this by analyzing first metadata and then by actually just listening to the transmission, it was frequently the case that different users within a network didn't have the same keys. Keys would be identified, so you could tell this by analyzing the metadata pretty easily. Um, that the key identifiers would sometimes just get out of sync. And the only way to resolve that if you don't have the keys is to turn the radio into the clear mode. Um, and so uh, it turns out there's a protocol for over-the-air rekeying that the federal government uses every month uh, for most agencies and every week for the really sensitive ones in which radios are sent new keys. And the new keys erase the old keys. Uh, and this is done radio by radio. And so if you're not in range with your radio at the time, at the time that the over-the-air rekeying broadcast uh, happens, and you forget to request new, key, uh, new keys be sent to you, your radio won't have, with high probability, will have the old keys in it, but your colleagues' radios will have the new keys in them. And so this protocol intended to keep keys up to date, in fact, helps ensure that keys won't stay up to date because of the way this this actually works. It's not a synchronized protocol where everybody updates at the same time. It's done radio by radio. And so, ironically, if you're one of the really sensitive agencies uh, where you're rekeying every week, it's much higher probability that you're, um, uh, that you're going to actually end up in the clear uh, because uh, people don't have the same key material. The, so that seemed to account for about half of the uh, clear traffic that we saw. Um, in fact, after we, any time we'd see an over-the-air rekeying transmission happen, we'd say, oh boy, we're about to see a bunch of clear text. And uh, that would last for you know, a few days or, or sometimes weeks uh, before um, uh, it would go back to being more encrypted um, than it was. So you know, we learned, you know, oh, first Wednesday of the month, um, um, uh, time to listen for some clear text. Um, that was yesterday. Uh, that was the day before yesterday, by the way. Um, so um, the other um, uh, the other thing is that their users don't actually know how to turn the crypto on and off. And you could say, well, that's the user's fault. But I think we can call this a pretty good usability failure. So let me just give an example of the user interface for these radios. So this is a Motorola XTS 5000 radio, which is probably the most common of these radios used by the by the federal government. It's an expensive walkie-talkie. It's roughly like a brick. It's very well built. You could hurt somebody with it. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like in its user interface. There's the top of the radio, and there's its front panel uh, display. Um, and, you know, it's a walkie-talkie radio. You know, you hold it up to your face. Um, there's, um, this is what it looks like when it's configured in the uh, clear mode. And uh, this is what it looks like when it's configured in the secure mode. 
Um, and the difference, you might notice, is there's this little switch on the top of the radio um, next to the antenna, and it's kind of hard to see, but you see there's a little like null symbol and a zero symbol, and that, that's actually a rotating switch that can go from one position to the other. And one of them means encrypted, and the other means clear. And helpfully, they also show that logo uh, in the middle of the display. Now, you can't actually see that display when you're using the radio because it's right in front of your nose. Um, but um, that's um, how it shows whether it's encrypted or clear. So we noticed um, that um, um, in listening to, you know, we'd listen to some of these transmissions. It was, it was great because it was like having our own private version of the wire. Um, we'd hear these little surveillance uh, operations uh, that, uh, that were going on. We, we would often hear the very first thing is, okay, I'm in secure mode. Um, and, you know, quite plainly, no, they're not. And then sometimes you have somebody explaining to somebody else, no, no, to get it in secure mode, you have to put it to the little circle. Um, the circle with the line is turns the encryption off, which is a perfectly you know valid guess. Um, but you know it's interesting. You could kind of make the argument either way. Well, you know one is closed and the other is open, maybe, and that seems to be the metaphor that they were going through. But it could be off and on, which is sort of the opposite way to do it. And there's widespread disagreement about what these symbols mean. But the but the manufacturer, uh, in this case Motorola. Um, thinks that this is what uh, the secure mode uh, should uh, look like. And so, there, you know, basically we discovered some incredibly subtle cryptographic failures and we had Travis do some great electrical engineering work in making this thing get all synchronized in order to force them to go into the clear, but it turns out that they would go into the clear without our help. Um, and uh, it was just um, um, really easy uh, to do. Okay, so where does that lead? Well, this suggests this is a failure at the systems level. This had failures a little bit at the cryptography level, more at the, um, at the implementation level, but completely at the systems level. Um, and, um, you know, this suggests we just don't, we aren't good at building systems. Uh, to do complex things like this. And in particular, I went to the standards group um, that uh, put this together. I went to the federal government and talked to them, and they were very friendly and concerned about it. Uh, and then I, you know, then they said, you know, you should talk to these people um, in the P25 um, security group. And I went there, and it was absolutely the most hostile group. I was lucky to get out with my life. They basically said, you don't understand why there's nothing wrong with this system. Um, it was, was kind of the thing that I, I spent, they spent a couple hours yelling at me and explaining, you know, you don't understand decibels, you don't understand radio, this system is fine. Um, so, you know, this was before that, that cartoon with the dog and the flames uh, was, was out, but, uh, um, but uh, that's, that's now what I think of. Okay, so, you know, we don't, the lesson from this is that building actual complex systems that are in fact reliably secure is actually a really hard thing to do. Um, and, you know, we could laugh at the designers of this, but, you know, they have a point when they say, uh, you know, every component of the system can point to some other component as the cause of the failure. Nobody, you know, there's no one thing wrong with this. It's, it's, it's wrong as a, it's wrong in combination, even when the components are actually uh, pretty strong. So where does that leave us? And I'm just going to spend uh, you know, a quick five minutes, and then I'll, you know, you can yell at me and explain why I don't ex understand decibels. But I, I want to spend uh, so a quick five minutes talking about a, the sort of current uh, public policy debate and what this sort of thing might tell us about that. Um, so in 1992, AT&T introduced this device called the TSD 3600, which was a telephone security device. Uh, it was basically a phone encryptor that would work on a wireline phone. $1,400 a piece. Um, <clears throat> they announced this product, would use DES and Diffie-Hellman key exchange and display a hash of the key on the phone. It was actually a very clever design, but $1,400 and you'd need two of them to encrypt your call. They sold just about as many of them as you could imagine. Um, the uh, uh, federal government, though, caught wind of this and utterly freaked out. 
Um, and they were worried that this would cause wiretaps to become obsolete, that criminals would buy these, and that wiretapping capability would go away. So they convinced AT&T to take out the DES chip that was built into it and replace it with um, uh, a new chip called Clipper. And Clipper basically uh, introduced a system called Key Escrow that would send an encrypted copy of the session key um, uh, as part of the initialization vector that you would send during the key exchange. The decryption key for that encrypted session key would be held in escrow by the government so that if there was a wiretap order against somebody who was using one of these, they could recover the session key uh, by getting the key out of escrow. Um, and so that was controversial um, and got much more attention than this phone would have otherwise got. Um, at, at this price. The government, by the way, agreed to buy a whole bunch of these in exchange for AT&T's redesign. And those phones ended up sitting in a warehouse um, somewhere and then got released as government surplus and you can buy them for about 40 bucks right now. Um, so um, Clipper had problems. I had actually discovered some of the problems um, in it and um, that killed off this particular idea. But we spent the 1990s um, arguing with the government about whether this idea broadly was a good idea. And by 2000, the government basically gave up. And it, it said, you know, actually encryption is important. We want to encourage the community to encrypt things because that is a national security issue. And um, this key escrow stuff is not going anywhere. Go forth and encrypt. Um, we will get out of this. And, you know, we crypto, the crypto war ended in about 2000. <coughs> they got rid of most of the export restrictions on encrypted products, and um, we lived happily ever after. Until Crypto War II. We didn't know to number the first crypto war, <coughs> but we are now <coughs> in Crypto War II, um, which started in about 2011 or so, about five years ago. It's um, summarized by FBI Director Comey, who, this is a typical quote <coughs> from congressional testimony. We are not, the law is not keeping up with technology. Those charged with protecting people aren't always able to access evidence when they need it to prosecute crime and prevent terrorism, even with lawful authority. Um, we often lack the technical capability to do so. And this, is, this has been a recurring theme. They call it going dark. And interestingly, this is fairly alarmist wording from uh, 2014. Um, if you look at the wiretap report from 2014 that lists, uh, from 2015 that lists um, uh, when encryption has been encountered in legal wiretaps, um, in uh, 2014 there were uh, a total of 41 cases, uh, 22 cases, um, and in two of them, officials were unable to uh, get the plain text. So this actually doesn't seem to be as large a problem. If you look at the federal government, you had another two cases. So there have been a total of four cases um, of um, encryption being encountered in wiretaps. But we can, you know, let's be optimistic and assume that that's just because we haven't figured out how to deploy crypto enough yet. Um, and that eventually we will succeed at deploying um, crypto. Okay, um, so what, you know, what do we do? Well, what they've advocated for um, is basically a return to key escrow. And, you know, I, I think we can take some of the lessons of failure that we've got to analyze whether or not key escrow style backdoors are likely to prevent crime or cause crime. And I think you can make an argument that backdoors are both dangerous, that is they make crypto systems weaker, and also ineffective. And I think it is probably unarguable, and I'm going to use the C word for just once, and because you're allowed to use it in Washington. We are in a national cybersecurity crisis, which is, you know, and I think that's unarguably true, you know, unarguably the case. Um, you know, we are seeing more data breaches than ever before. We are seeing 
um, systems failing left and right. And, you know, our ability to secure systems seems to be outpaced by our ability to build weak systems. Um, you know, every time, we, you know, we, we take one step forward and two steps backwards um, with uh, progress we're making, and there's really no end in sight to this. We actually really only have two uh, proven tools um, that can help secure complex systems uh, like we use for our infrastructure. One of those tools is crypto, um, because that means we have to trust fewer components. Um, and we actually know how to do crypto reasonably well. And the, the other is make systems as simple as possible. And we're terrible at doing that, but when we are able to do it, we, we, we know that it gives us a pretty good chance of um, working. Um, and unfortunately, the backdoor concept makes systems more complex, so it, it, it attacks our ability to make them simple, and it also attacks the crypto by in particular making the crypto more complex and increasing its attack surface. So the, the backdoor concept attacks head-on really the only two security mechanisms we have that have a proven track record of success in real systems. Um, and worse, backdoors are easily evaded, right? I mean, it's, you know, crypto software is available. Um, there's this thing called the internet and you can download software on it. Um, and, um, you know, people even write books and teach classes about how to, how to do these things. Uh, the secret is out. And so if we mandate that, you know, Apple and Microsoft and, and so on, um, incorporate these mechanisms, um, you know, building encryption on top of that that doesn't have the backdoor would be a fairly straightforward thing to do. So we're, we're stuck with these two potentially unreconcilable, um, problems. The first is we can't afford more security vulnerabilities and lawful access either is or will be, um, getting harder. And that is where we are today, uh, in a world in which we are doing a terrible job securing our systems, and the only people who seem to think that um, computer security is actually too good are at the FBI. Um, so, um, so with that, um, thanks very much for coming back from lunch. And you know, I think I. So um, I think I think I have a couple minutes. You can yell at me, or yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it was well. The the people who did the over the air radio stuff and the people who did the um, security were different people, and it was a bit bolted. You know, the standard was deployed with the idea that there would be hooks to do security in it. And, you know, so, you know, it wasn't inherently as bad as that sounds. Uh, but literally, when I went to the meeting, I said, you know, the standard looks as if somebody from the NSA showed up for the first couple meetings and then stopped showing up. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was Roger. He died. And they never replaced him. Um, so, I mean, literally, um, that, you know, the, the, the assumption that I made turned out to be exactly right. Um, so, yeah. I, I would be shocking to me, you know, and who's Big Brother, right? You know, uh, the nice thing about Big Brothers is that, you know, there are so many people with Big Brothers out there. So, you know, if you, if you, uh, trust, um, one, um, you know, uh, that doesn't mean you trust, you should be trusting all of them. And, you know, oh yeah, the, don't get me started on the certification mess that we're in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, thanks, thanks very much. And, uh, see you soon.